Okay, welcome to an another operations research video. Today's topic is sensitivity. This first video will sort of be a setup uh, video. The theme of sensitivity is really looking at um, how are the solutions to my uh, linear program sensitive to the various inputs to the problem? Okay, and so uh, we're going to go back to Geppetto's workshop here, and we've got um, our objective and our constraints, and we can kind of think of each of the numbers that show up here. Um, for example, the amount of profit for soldiers and trains, uh, the amount of finishing carpentry and demand, as well as even we could consider the coefficients inside uh, inside the constraints on the left-hand side as well. How is our, our answer, our, our final value, sensitive to those, um, the, those parameters of the problem? Okay. Uh, I put this uh, quote in here just for fun. Um, nothing to do with linear programming. Uh, but I get a chuckle out of it any, every time. So um, we're going to work with uh, Geppetto's problem. And maybe let's let's talk through what are those parameters that we're going to be thinking about um, as we deal with this problem. And it might be helpful to kind of group them into three different things. Um, so we've got our coefficients in our objective here. And so that's going to be the vector sort of three and two. Um, pulling off those co coefficients, we'll look at what happens if we change either of those uh, amounts of profit. Remember, um, maybe I'll kind of make a note here. X1 is number of soldiers. X2 is number of trains that Geppetto is making in his workshop. Uh, and so three and two represent the profit for soldiers and trains, respectively. Um, we've got our right-hand side vector B, and that, that's these values here. Um, that's the amount of resources we have available. So we've got 100 hours of finishing, 80 hours of carpentry, and 40 hours of demand for soldiers. Not hours, 40 units of demand for soldiers. Okay, and so we'll look at what happens if we maybe allocate more of these resources. Or in the case of demand for soldiers, maybe we uh, run an advertising campaign to try to increase that demand. And then we've got our constraint matrix, uh, which kind of has all the coefficients from over here. And so that's going to be our A matrix. And that's going to be 2, 1, 1, 1. Uh, here's a 1 in front of x1, and there's no x2 there, so that's a 0 for the x2 variable. Okay, so these are essentially the inputs or the parameters of the problem. And the question is, how, in what way does our answer or our solution change if we were to mess with any one of these um, parameters? So uh, that's the starting values. Here's the final values or the final tableau. And so labeling our columns here, we've got Z, X1, X2, slack for finishing, slack for carpentry and slack for demand in our right-hand side. So those are our columns there. And we can label our rows based off of our basis. Um, so the objective row has Z. Um, I've set this up so that X1 is the first row, X2 is the second row, and then I get the last standard basis vector over here with slack for demand. Okay, and so I've got all of those uh, labeled there. Let's kind of highlight the different parts of this. Um, here, this 180, that's the current objective value. Um, and so that's equal to a couple different ways we could represent that value. Um, it's, uh, if we look at just the values of uh, the cost or the C vector, corresponding to our basis, take the transpose, multiply that by B inverse, and then by B. That's one way uh, to compute this value of Z. Uh, we'll remember that we kind of make a helpful replacement here in that uh, our dual variables for this problem, uh, which maybe I should circle those, those are right here. of 110, those are equal to CB transpose B inverse, 
All of these come from that fundamental insights of uh, the simplex method video. And so if this is unfamiliar or you've forgotten, go back and refresh on that. And so uh, recognizing that this is our dual variables or y, uh, we could then rewrite this as y transpose b. And so that's how we get our interpretation of y as the shadow prices. They're essentially the value attached to uh, the amount of resources that we um, specify. Um, let's see, let's pick out another part of this. So this here is going to be xb, uh, which is the solution of our basis uh, variables. And so um, from, and this is equal to B inverse B. And this tells us that our current solution, which is our optimal solution, because um, this is the final tableau, is, um, let's see, X1 is 20, X2 is 60, uh, SF and FC, SF and SC are both non-basic variables. And so they get values of zero and zero. And then SD is um, 20. And so that's X1, X2, uh, SF, SC, and SD. Okay. So uh, essentially this vector gives us the values for just the basic variables, the non-basic variables we then fill in with zeros. Um, this part that's underneath the slack variables, that's B inverse. So if we take the columns of our um, basis matrix, so the columns in the original matrix that are underneath each of our basic variables, and put them together into a B matrix, this is the inverse of that matrix, okay? And the, it's a beautiful thing that we don't actually have to manually invert the matrix, but if we have a tableau, we could actually read off the current value of B inverse. Um, this here is B inverse times our original A matrix. And then this part right here is, there's a couple ways we can think about this. Um, Let's see, it is, think about it as C, B, transpose B inverse times A minus C transpose. Uh, then we can use the fact that um, C, B, transpose B inverse is Y. And so this ends up being equal to Y transpose A minus C transpose. And we call this the reduced cost. And so maybe let, let's kind of label these things. So this is our reduced cost. Uh, y transpose here, that's our dual variables or our shadow prices. Um, Y transpose B or Z, this is our uh, objective. This is our basic solution. There. And then I guess this is the inverse of our B matrix. And this is sort of what our A matrix becomes after transformation. Neither of these are as interesting in themselves, but they will play a useful role because especially this B inverse, you'll notice that it, that shows up in our dual variables, it shows up in our objective, it shows up at, in our right-hand side uh, after transformation or our basic solution. Um, it shows up everywhere. So um, the basis and, and it's the basic matrix and its inverse affect everything. And, and that's actually maybe why uh, changes to the basic matrix are so tough to deal with as far as thinking about how they affect um, the solutions. Okay. Um, yeah, let's maybe just summarize what we have sort of spread out all over here um, as far as the different parts of our matrix uh, or our tableau. And so I'll split this up in maybe a little bit more generality into our Z variables, our X variables, our slack variables, and then our right-hand side. Ooh, did I give myself enough room? Maybe not. Um, well, the Z column's always going to have a one there. Underneath in the X in the um, objective row 
that's where we'll get the reduced costs of Y transpose A minus C transpose. Underneath the S, that's where we'll get our Y transpose. And then our right-hand side will be uh, Y transpose B. Un, uh, let's see, so then let's see, this first row is all these corresponds to Z. Uh, the, the rest of the rows correspond to the current basis, which will denote XB. Um, here we'll have B inverse A, B inverse, and B inverse B. Okay. So, uh, and then maybe the only thing I need to note off to the side here is that Y transpose equals CB transpose B inverse. Okay. So the question is, as we change these values up here, how does the final tableau change? Um, and when would that change uh, require us to essentially switch to a different basis? Okay. Um, in that we'll switch to a different basis or we'll be forced to switch to a different basis if one of two things happens. One, we'll have to switch if we're um, no longer feasible. Uh, and the other reason we'd have to switch is that we're no longer optimal. Okay. And so let's maybe talk just a little bit in our setup is uh, what is our feasibility uh, condition and what's our optimality condition. So uh, feasible if, well, we need that this XB, the basic solution, needs to be greater than or equal to zero. As long as it's greater than or equal to zero, we're still feasible. If any of the entries of the basic solution go negative, then we are now into infeasible uh, solutions and we've left our feasible region. So um, our current solution is feasible if um, XB, which is B inverse B, if all those entries are greater than or equal to zero, okay? Uh, we're optimal if two things, uh, and we need both of them. We need that all of uh, the values in our objective row are greater than or equal to zero for a maximization problem. We're sort of doing this assuming a maximization problem. Um, it's, I guess, the exact opposite for a minimization problem. They'll be all less than or equal to zero. So we're optimal if uh, Y transpose A minus C transpose is greater than or equal to zero, and if Y transpose all those elements are greater than or equal to zero. Those are exactly the constraints of the dual problem. And so, um, yeah, we're we're optimal if the corresponding or complementary dual solution is feasible, okay? Um, maybe a kind of side note, we're feasible if the, uh, uh, the corresponding complementary dual solution satisfies the optimality condition for, for the dual problem. Um, that's gonna be maybe uh, less useful, but uh, still, still somewhat useful as we're going through sen uh, um, sensitivity and, at, uh, at a point a little bit later on, uh, we'll, um, we'll use the dual simplex problem, which sort of works uh, from the dual uh, side of the problem to sort of re-optimize. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw a picture for Geppetto in uh, Desmos, and I'll kind of talk about sensitivity from a visual aspect um, there. So let's go ahead and uh, let me switch my share. Okay, so here I put the three constraints for Geppetto's problem into here. Um, here's the fe feasible region. Uh, in sensitivity analysis, we want to think of any of the numbers in these constraints, as well as the objective, as now being parameters that we can change. And so let's uh, maybe, I'll show you that. So let's change this uh, value here. I'll go ahead and call that B1 and add a slider for it and I'll put it up to 100, and that uh, gets us where we were before, and let me maybe, uh... okay, so here's here it is at 100. If I reduce the amount of resources that I have, that constraint is gonna slide to the left, and at some point, um, my optimal solution, which um, if we kind of recall from previously, it's this point 2060, 
if I, if I um, reduce the amount of, um, I think this is finishing hours. Yep, if I uh, reduce the amount of finishing hours, that optimal solution right there will actually slide to the left until it reaches the point where these two uh, constraints are now intersecting each other at 80, zero, and then it actually slides past it and that solution would become infeasible, okay? Um, if I go the other way, maybe let's let this go up to as much as 200. If I slide the other way and increase it, you'll notice that that constraint slides to the right, okay? Um, let's put this back at 100. We can think about uh, the other parameters in the, this problem as also having essentially sliders. And as we move those sliders, our feasible region gets deformed, at least when we're changing the sliders corresponding to our constraints. Um, if we're changing the sliders corresponding to the um, objective coefficients, um, that would sort of change the direction that, that is kind of preferred as far as optimization goes. And we'll talk about those changes as well. But um, as we change these parameters, you can think of that as sliding uh, the parameters in different ways. If we change, let me maybe call this um, two, let's change that to an A and uh, add a slider for that. And let's see, it started off at two. So there, there we are back at what it was originally. But you'll notice that as I change this slider, because it's a coefficient on the left-hand side of the constraint, it essentially is changing the slope um, of the constraint. And so um, this optimal point right here will sort of move kind of left as I slide it up and right as I slide it down. And eventually that point will sort of move outside uh, the feasible region. And so now it's way over here. Okay. So let me turn that back to two. Okay. So it just helps to have a visual picture that uh, the changes that we make um, will mostly be looking at what those changes do algebraically. Um, but you can also think about it geometrically as these constraints either sliding or um, changing their slope as you change the parameters of the problem. Okay. Uh, so that's it for this video. Quick introduction to what is sensitivity. It's essentially um, exploring what happens as we change the parameters of the problem. Um, the next several videos will step through um, each of the possible changes that we could make to our problem. Uh, we'll talk about uh, changes to the right-hand side. We'll talk about adding variables, adding constraints, um, changes to columns of basic variables, and changes to columns of non-basic variables. Uh, and that's pretty much all the changes we could do. Um, and so you'll kind of step through those over the next several videos. That's it for this one.